One Body in Christ, Second Sunday in Ordinary Time. Today's second reading from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, his first letter to the Corinthians, helps us to understand a famous teaching of St. Paul, which is sometimes termed St. Paul's teaching on the mystical body. And this occurs in chapter 12. And in chapter 12, St. Paul, in describing our relationship with Jesus, describes that relationship, that corporate relationship we have as a community of believers with Jesus as like a body. And he says, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. One way of understanding this image of St. Paul, which is more than an image, it's also reality, is by understanding Jesus as the head, and we are everything down below. We are the body. And that is one understanding. But there's another understanding, and this comes from reading chapter 12 in light of today's first reading, which comes from chapter 6, and also the entire chapter 6, what came before. And there, St. Paul is referring to one body, but in the context of a marital body, where two become one flesh, a husband and wife, two separate bodies, two separate heads, two hearts, but they become one body with one mind, one head, one heart, where they participate together, and the two become one flesh. And we see that in the, the excerpt from chapter 6 and also in chapter 6. So that's also another way of understanding what it means to be part of the body of Jesus Christ. And this image comes to us the first time of two bodies becoming one body, two forms of flesh becoming one flesh in Genesis. When Adam, after Eve is created, looks upon her and says this to her, this is at last bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And then the verse that follows that says, Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. The two become one flesh. Similarly, St. Paul teaches us in his letter to Corinthians, chapter 6, which our excerpt from this Mass is from, that our very bodies and our souls are intended to become members of Christ, where we become one spirit with him. In a good marriage, when the two become one, the more dominant or the more powerful of the, whether it's the husband or wife, doesn't swallow up the one who has less power. power. Rather, the two are meant, as St. Paul teaches as well in another letter, to be mutually subordinate to one another, where each one respects the other's autonomy, but at the same time, paradoxically, they are also one flesh, two in one, diversity in unity. And we learn that from the Trinity as well, three in one. In this case, in a marital relationship, it's two in one. And out of that two in the one is intended by God to bear fruit where there is a third, there is a child. And in that triad relationship, or also the relationship of husband and, husband and wife, there are two distinct ent entities, but at the same time, they are united as one flesh. And this is similar to, in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus doesn't want to swallow us up where all our personality disappears. Think of the great, lives, great saints. They're very, very unique, and yet very, very holy. And the reason why they're holy is because Christ's life comes out through them, but in a pattern that is creative, a pattern that is always surprising in the lives of the saints, because two have become one flesh in Jesus Christ, one spirit with him. Soon we will be receiving the body and blood and soul and divinity of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. In so doing, we will become one flesh with Jesus' flesh. And as that happens, we become living temples, as St. Paul states in the second readings. And not only temples in the plural, but also temple in the singular. Because, as St. Peter teaches us in his letter, chapter 4, verse 4, his first letter, 
We are like living stones of the most beautiful temple in the world, and we are built into a spiritual house, one spiritual house, which is the temple of the Lord, which is the temple of Jesus Christ. Corporately, together, we are a living temple. And God intends us to be the most beautiful temple, the most beautiful church on earth that rivals all the wonderful, beautiful churches that are throughout the world. What are the characteristics that make us the most beautiful church? Well, according to God's vision, it is our true love, our charity for one another. And when we grow in love, grow in true love, we really then shine forth a beauty that far surpasses the beauty of the most beautiful church on earth. A characteristic, but not the only one, where we demonstrate, we shine forth our beauty collectively together as a loving family, as a loving people, is how we treat the lowliest among us, how we treat those that sometimes we deem as poor. And we all are poor. We're all lowly in some aspect, in some respect, including our leaders. So may we treat the lowly among us with great respect, with tenderness, with kindness, with mercy, with compassion, and at times as well with firm, truthful love. In the light of today's scriptural teachings, may we examine our consciences to see how we have not up, lived up to our sacred calling to together be the most beautiful church in the world, where our beauty, our attractiveness, is defined by our care for one another, since we are the body of Christ, his living stones. God bless.